let me ask you something. Do you feel welcomed by being told off? I've seen that done as part of what in our congregations we call the welcome. Being told off for being late, not sitting together, or not singing heartily enough. Is that welcoming? I don't think so. Perhaps there's a point to be made, but that's not a welcome. Or what about somebody confessing their sins? Seen that done as part of the welcome as well. What's that got to do with why we're there to worship God? I fail to see the connection. These things may have been done sincerely, but they're not terribly welcoming. When what we're doing doesn't match with what we're saying we are doing, which is the welcome, then something's wrong. I think that, in my opinion, this might be the part of our regular Sunday services that is least well understood in terms of its purpose and might be the least well practiced. So I pray to put that right in this episode. Hello, I'm Malcolm, by the way, and this is Teaching Tips number 376, and it's the third part of our current series, Hosting Sunday Worship. Today, we're continuing the series exploring why we do what we do on a Sunday gathering. Uh, so far, we've introduced the concept of hosting to frame the role of those leading us in public worship. We've examined some New Testament examples and teachings on collective worship. We've also considered the aims of collective worship. And last week, we explored general guidance for leaders of worship, including context, attitude, connections, themes, overloading, and preparation. You might want to go back and watch those two as context for this one. Today, we're going to focus on one specific part of our Sunday worship, which I've already mentioned, the welcome. So first of all, let's talk about tradition. You see, what you and I call the welcome is a tradition. It's not something that's mandated in Scripture. I'm not sure that anyone knows where, when, and why it started. It's not a bad tradition, but it helps us to remember that it's neither commanded in Scripture nor necessary for our collective worship to be legitimate and effective. That being said, welcoming everyone to collective worship fits the hosting model we've been exploring in the last couple of episodes. I like to be welcomed by my guest, by my host, if I'm a guest at someone's home. And if I'm hosting, I like to welcome people when they come to my home. It makes sense to have some kind of welcoming action at some part near the beginning of the service, doesn't it? So let's think about this. What are we doing when we are welcoming people? I'd say this. We're welcoming people to collective worship in the conscious presence of our Heavenly Father. That's the context of our gathering, isn't it? Welcoming people knowing that He is present. We're not <clears throat> doing the welcome as it's often phrased, but we are welcoming people. This does bug me. I have to confess perhaps a little too much, but we're not doing a welcome. The welcome is not a thing, it's an action. We are welcoming people. It's a bit like when people say, we had a baptism. You didn't have a baptism. Somebody was baptized into Christ. That is an action. So the welcome is a, not a thing, it's an action, expression of love, it's an invitation, it's a call to wholehearted participation in what makes our collective worship meaningful. Worshipping God together in prayer and in song, learning from God's word together, fellowshipping together, communing together in the Lord's Supper, that's what we are being welcomed to. Let's remember what it is we're actually doing. Welcoming people under the conscious presence of God to collectively enjoy being with Him together as we worship Him. So, how do we welcome people? Well, this is going to vary from culture to culture, so let me not be uh, overly specific, I think. But the key thing I'm going to state might be quite obvious, which is to be welcoming is to be welcoming, as in smile, as in look at people. How welcomed do you feel if someone says welcome, but they're not looking at you? Look at the people in front of you. Warmth is more important than anything else. If you're glad to see everyone, and let's hope so, let it show. The question to ask yourself as you are welcoming everybody or as you're preparing to welcome people 
is whether everyone present feels welcomed and accepted by you on behalf of God. I know you can't control how people feel, but you're aiming to help them to feel that warmth from God coming through you. Now, with that said, let me give you a few specific tips. Now, this could be a very long list, so I'll keep it short with just a few for today, and you can always add some more in the uh, in the comments. Firstly, tip number one, connect with what has just happened if something has happened before you stand up to welcome everybody. In other words, let's say a song has been sung before you get up there, connect with the song. That song moved me because, or that song was meaningful to me because. And then go into whatever else you're going to say and welcoming everybody. And then as you conclude, link with the next thing. So you wrap up what you're saying and welcoming everybody. And then you'll say, now we will pray about, or now the children will go to their classes, whatever the next thing is. Connect with what's just happened and connect with what's about to happen. That helps the service not to get disjointed. Second tip, if you have a visiting speaker preaching or teaching in some sense, introduce them with enough detail to clarify why they are with us. It's one thing to say, it's great to have Jim with us. It's another thing to say, Jim has a special expertise in, and that's why we've invited him. Or Jim has a particular connection with his congregation because he used to be here. You may not know that. That's why he's here today. If you don't know that visiting speaker, don't just stand up there and, and, and spout nonsense. Ask somebody else who does know them to introduce them. Thirdly, involve the children wherever possible. Get them involved. They actually love it, most of them, generally speaking, especially if you do it in a good way. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, then talk to some of the children's ministry people who know how to interact with children and see if they can give you some help. It's, it's really fun to involve the kids at the beginning with a little bit of a quiz or some participatory something or other. It's, it's a lot of fun. So try and involve the children wherever you can. If they feel welcomed, their parents will feel welcomed. And that's particularly important for our guests who come along. Fourthly, keep it simple. Keep it simple. There is nothing wrong with standing up to welcome everybody and saying, welcome to our worship today. It is lovely to see all of you. Let's pray. That is welcoming everybody. That'll do. You don't have to be sophisticated. You don't have to be long. You don't have to be intellectual. You don't have to use 16 scriptures. Keep it simple. And finally, in these tips, make God the focus of your welcoming. In other words, the focus is not the congregation. It's not yourself. It's not current events. If you do mention yourself or the church or contemporary issues, then connect them with God, preferably using scripture where you can. For example, if political elections are on the horizon, like we've just had in the UK uh, not so long ago, that's a good opportunity to reference the following passage in 1 Timothy 2 and use it as inspiration for perhaps a prayer that might follow. You know the passage in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So you might reference that connecting to the recent election or upcoming election and say, we need to pray for everybody involved in these elections. Please pray with me. That's a way to bring in contemporary events into, under, in a sense, the sovereignty and, uh, of God. And together, collectively, we are then acknowledging that God has a hand in all that's going on. So those are some simple tips. I'm sure you've got some of your own, so let me know. Let me, before we finish, though, cover a few common gaffes that I've heard more than once, and I'd have to say I have done more than once. But let me give you a few, and again, you can add your own. Common gaffes to avoid. Number one, embarrassing individuals, embarrassing people. So for example, what I mean by that is, this phrase has been used more than once. If you are visiting for the first time, please stand up so we can welcome you. That is not welcoming. That is terrifying for most people. The intention of doing that is sincere. We want people to feel welcome, but the experience for most first time visitors is painful. They are already feeling insecure in an unfamiliar situation. They've never been in the building. They don't know hardly anybody there. They don't know what's going to happen next. They don't know what it's going to be like. Now, 
that you've made them stand up and they've got a whole crowd of strangers staring at them. That does not make them feel welcomed. What makes them feel welcomed is someone at the door when they come through the door before the service even begins, recognizing that they are a first time guest and welcoming them personally with a nice smile and a few kind words. That's actually what's welcoming. So avoid embarrassing people. Number two, gaff to avoid over hyping. What I mean by that is a phrase such as we're going to have a great service today. And everybody goes, Amen. Well, what if it isn't a great service? I mean, how do you know it's going to be a great service? I know our great God is with us, but I've been at some services where God was present, but they weren't particularly great. It would be better to say, I'm looking forward to our time of worship today. I'm looking forward to this service today. It's an I statement. You can't tell everybody else how to feel. Sometimes our services are not very inspiring, let's be honest. And the service's effectiveness depends on the attendee's experience. Telling people it will be great is tantamount to telling them how to feel. And that's not a welcoming experience. Number three in these gaffes to avoid, avoid preaching in your welcome, unless it is actually the sermon. Avoid preaching. It's not a problem to share something God has taught you during the week or something like that, but don't make it a 10 minute lesson. We have a sermon coming down the line. We talked a bit about that in the last episode. And fourthly, and very importantly, avoid jargon. What do I mean by jargon? This would depend a little bit on your context and your culture. But I'm thinking about phrases like, I was convicted, or my discipler told me, or I had an awesome quiet time yesterday. That's very alienating for our guests who don't know what those phrases mean. And frankly, it sounds pretty weird. Also, because none of those words really are even in Scripture. So it's better to say things like, rather than I was convicted, you might want to say, I felt a bit guilty about something. A, a visitor can, can connect with that. Or instead of my discipler, the person mentoring me in Christ or the person helping me to grow in Christ. That makes sense. Or rather than quiet time, you might talk about the other day I was spending some time in prayer and I was reading this passage in the Bible that, and you go on to explain it. So just avoid the jargon. Bear in mind, our visitors, our visitors don't know what you're talking about. So questions for reflection and discussion. I got two questions for you here to think about. Firstly, what helps you to feel welcomed to an event? Think about times when you've been welcomed in an effective way. It's really, you felt really welcomed. What was going on? What were they doing? What was, situ what was the situation and how might that affect how you welcome people on a Sunday? Secondly, if we didn't have a welcome, what would our collective worship lose? Would we lose anything? If we were to lose something, what would it be? And how does that affect then what we do when we welcome people on a Sunday? Those are some questions for reflection and discussion. And to finally wrap up, I think it is delightful to be warmly welcomed to someone's home. So let's remember what we're trying to do on a Sunday when we welcome people and let's not get stuck in unexamined tradition. Take the pressure off yourself by recognizing that your demeanor is much more important than your words. Now it's time for the challenge of the week. The challenge of the week is this. The next time that you have an opportunity to publicly welcome people on a Sunday, maybe even this coming Sunday, challenge yourself to be brief, to the point, but warm. Three things, brief, to the point, and warm. Do those three things. People will feel welcomed and it'll be a great experience for everybody. Next week, we will consider the purpose and the practice of collectively praying together. If you have any thoughts, then please let me know. Add your comments on this week's topic. We learn best when we're learning in community, so leave the comments publicly wherever you can. If you have a question about the Bible, do drop me a, a, an email via the address that's on the screen right there. If you'd like a free copy of my ebook on spiritual disciplines, How God Grows His People, then sign up for my newsletter at the website. Pass this link on to anybody that might benefit. Subscribe and leave a review. And remember, always, 
to keep calm and carry on teaching. Take care and God bless. <laughs> <laughs>